a ministry wife is a vocation without a job description. And let's be honest, sometimes it seems like ministry might be easier if we did have one. If you are a ministry wife like me and are looking for hope, perspective, and a little bit of practical advice regarding your role, you're in the right place. I'm Christine Hoover, and welcome to the Ministry Wives Podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. Join me as we hear from women from various ministry contexts having authentic conversations about our shared joys and challenges, even the ones we're unsure we can talk about out loud. No topic is off limits. Today, my guest is Christy Anyabwile. Christy is married to the Beatty, and together they serve at their church in the D.C. area. Christy is also the author of Literarily, How Understanding Bible Genres Transforms Bible Study, and editor of His Testimonies, My Heritage, Women of Color on the Word of God. She is passionate about biblical literacy and uses her gifts in training women to study and teach the Bible. Christy joins me today to talk about raising pastor's kids, specifically of the teenage variety. She answers questions today about how she has helped her kids love God and the church, and how she's helped them find their place of service within the church. Christy is a wealth of wisdom in this conversation, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So here, friends, is my conversation with Christy Anubwile. Christy, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to have you. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I when I thought about parenting teenagers in while in ministry, you came to my mind because I know that you have kids who have already left the house mm-hmm. and you have still one in the house. And so you're at the perfect stage to kind of say, oh, here's some things that I've done and here's some things that I'm still doing and still learning. And so I'm so excited to have you speaking to us about raising teenagers in the pastor's home. So I'd love for you to just start by telling us about your family and your ministry currently. Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, every parent loves to have an opportunity to talk about their kids, reflect on parenting Mm -hmm. and even the the good, bad, and the ugly, you know, it's just, (laughs) you know, it's part of what we do as parents is just um, kind of rehearse the years, right? And rehearse God's faithfulness to us, even in the midst of difficult seasons and things like that. And that's how we grow. So I'm excited about this conversation. But um, yeah, so Thabiti is my husband. We've been married 31 years now and um, been together 34 and we have three children. Our oldest is 24, and she um, is um, has been working for the past few years, um, and now she's into her master's program in English, and so we're excited for her in this next phase of life. And then my uh, second daughter, she um, is also working full-time, and both of them live away from home now. It was really nice to have them for a season uh, during the early part of the pandemic, having all the family back together, even though they were out of school and in college and different things. Um, So it was nice to have them home for a season, but they're off doing their own thing. And I would, another thing about, and so, and then I have a son, my third one, (laughs) I'll leave him out. And he is middle teenager doing all the teenage boy fun things and he brings all the teenage drama in the house and it's a lot of fun so it's just <laughs> about like friendships and socialization and all that kind of stuff and yeah so so those are my and then I have a dog he's a <laughs> puppy we got him um August 2020 and he really is like another child in the house and he is the most spoiled one here uh in my household so that's, that's a great. little bit about my family. One other thing I'll say, as I was just kind of thinking about this conversation we were going to have, and again, reflecting on parenting and raising children, something happened a few weeks ago. And I was like, oh man, it was one of those moments as a parent where you're like, wait, I'm in a different phase and I haven't really processed this. Yes. So my daughter called me, she FaceTimed me, my oldest. And she recently moved, you know, moved away. 
And um, and she, my, she and my second daughter, they're in different cities. So one is in North Carolina, the other is in Tennessee. She FaceTimed me and I'm looking at her, but then my middle, my second daughter is in the FaceTime too. And I'm like, how are they in the same space? Like, this is weird. And, <laughs> and I was like, where are you? And she said, oh, I went, I, you know, I went to visit um, Eden in, you know, down in Chattanooga. And that, it just like, it just threw me for a loop. I'm yeah. Like, oh. like, I know both of them are away from home and I know they both have their own place. They both have their own apartments in different states and all of that. But it just kind of like threw me for a loop. I'm like, wow, my adult children, they have their own homes and they're visiting one another mm -hmm. in each other's homes, like going to spend weekends together, you know, in each other's home. It just. I don't know. That just threw me for a loop. I wasn't prepared for it. <laughs> yeah, it's like you are in a different season now. Your adult yeah. children are friends and spending yes. time apart from you like, and the I family. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't yeah. even know. Like, I didn't arrange anything. Yeah. So, and there's some more things that have happened like that that kind of have taken me aback a little bit. Maybe I'll throw in as we have this yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, I love that's a little bit about my family. Yeah. Well, in ministry wise, you guys are in DC, correct? Yes, we're in DC. Mm -hmm. And y'all have been there for how long now? Eight years now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to know what you just the combination of where you are in family life and in ministry life, eight years in for your yeah. church plant. What are some of the joys and things that you're loving about that combination right now? About right now of the yeah. family? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I think as my children have grown, I mean, they've always been a part of the ministry with us, right? And we mm -hmm. try to instill in them that, yes, dad's a pastor, but we minister together as a family. I mean, you know. Any everything from hospitality to showing up for events and things like that in church, um, praying for our church family, uh, praying for Thabiti and the things that he's doing in ministry. So the kids have always been aware and around, but not always 100% involved, just depending on their age and things like that. So I think now at this phase, it's just fun and beautiful to see them more fully rolled into the life of the church because they want to. Mm. Right. And so, um, and again, that's looked different in different seasons as they have grown, but you know, uh, my oldest, because she was here, has been here the longest, you know, she's become a member of the church and been baptized. She's has her own community within the church of, you know, being discipled and in small groups and, you know, just developing her own networks and friendships as a young adult in the church. The same thing is happening with my son as a teenager as well. And so he's kind of finding his place where he wants to serve. Right. And so right now he, you know, he wants to volunteer in the, in the children's ministry. Um, and so that is, yeah, I, for me, just a joy to watch as my kids are growing, just seeing them find their place in the life of the church that is independent of me or my husband kind of, you know, carting them here, there or right. wherever. Yeah. Okay. I know every mom listening, they are thinking, how did you do that? That's our desire when we're raising our kids is every mom's desire. They want their kids to have faith in the Lord and they we, they want them to have a love for the church. And sometimes raising pastor's kids, we worry because there's so much that we do at the church that our kids are going to be turned off. And so I would love to know, first of all, you, you mentioned about your daughter. You said she wants to. Mm -hmm. How how did you help them cultivate that of, of the want to, or I guess seeing the beauty of the local church and wanting to be a part of that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. You know, families are different in this. And so obviously I'm just sharing my experience and uh, what has worked for our family. So I'm sure, I hope everyone knows that anything I say here is just, you know, it works for our family. It might not work for yours. So, you know, you know, you have to kind of trial and error yourself, but, and just pray through it. But for me, uh, or for us, we have tried to 
give them as much freedom as possible to be involved and to not be involved. And so I think even early on when uh, my children were much, our children were much younger, uh, when let's say, for example, we ha- we have, you know, a lot of people over in this, in our home, right. And hospitality yes. is a whole thing. And I love hospitality. So I'm like, come on, bring on the people, the more the merrier. Uh, <laughs> and my whole family, they're all introverts. So they're like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like, <laughs> we, we need to decompress. So we learned really early on with our children that when we have people over for hospitality, we need to give them an out so they don't feel like they have to sit at the table, fall asleep, you know, get anxious about homework and those kinds of things because we have people over for dinner. Right. And so um, early on, we realized like, you know what? Titus is falling asleep at the table. (laughs) Maybe we should like force him to just sit here, you know, in this adult conversation for too long. So we, um, and so when they were young, we always say, okay, you know, Miss Christine, her family are coming over for dinner. Uh, We're going to have dinner. Either we might talk a little bit about their family and what they do, especially if it was something that was of interest to our children. Like, oh, she really loves books, so you may want to ask her about books. Or Mm -hmm. she has a dog, you may want to ask her about her dog. You know, so kind of prime them a little bit so they can have some conversation if they want to. Again, no pressure if they don't. Uh, But then once dinner is over, and and you know we've had dinner, we've had dessert we always give them an opportunity to ask to be excused from the table so they don't feel like they have to, you know, just like, oh my gosh, kind of hang out with adult conversation when they really don't have the capacity, number one, and two, have other things that maybe they need to be working on with school or bed or whatever, or just their own time. And so for us, it's been giving them as much freedom as we can could to be involved or to not be involved. Now, certain things are non-negotiables, right? So as a family, we worship together. So we're, you know, there's certain things that we do as a family, going to church and those kinds of, that kind of stuff. But as far as the life of the church, are they going to go to this event? Are they going to participate in a play? Are they going to be in the children's choir? Are they going to, um, I don't know, whatever, go to a picnic? Are they going to participate in an outreach event? We, a, mo- a lot of the times, if we could give them the choice of, we would give them the choice of whether or not they want to participate in that activity. We don't want church and church activity to feel forced, to feel like labor, to feel like something they have to do. We want it to be, want to cultivate in them a desire to do it. So we explain, this is what we're going to do. This is why we think it's valuable. You choose whether or not, you know, whether or not you want to go, Right. Um, and so that's not a hundred percent all the time. There's about, I'm just, what I, I guess what I'm saying is being intentional, intentional about finding ways for, to give our children freedom in terms of how much they want to participate and just doing it with a little discernment and, and just looking for those opportunities. Cause I think it's, Parents, a lot of times we're like, no, they're kids, they're in my house, they're young, whatever we do, they're doing. You know, if we go to this place, they're going to this place. And we cart our kids around so much, they just start to resent church and church activity and they're bitter. Oh, do we have to go? Do we have to do this? And I just, I don't like that. I just, I want my kids to want to. So that's part of it. And then the other part of it is um, finding, and so And then some of it is just maturity, right? And so my oldest, when she was ready, you know, she made the decision that, hey, you know, I want to go through the membership process. You know, I want to become a member of the church. I want to be baptized. Um, She just did that on her own just because that's how she, you know, had been growing and maturing as an individual. And so a part of it. And so that as well. And again, Lots of (laughs) different views on this, but even when it comes down to, and this might get me in a lot of trouble, even when it comes down to quiet time, am I going to force my children to have quiet time or not? You know, and we've done it. We've, we've bought them Bible studies and, you know, kids Bibles and study Bibles and this aid and that aid, and just trying to force feed them into the faith and it doesn't work like that, (laughs) right? 
faith doesn't come by force feeding. It comes by the work of the spirit in the heart, whether that heart is a little heart that's five, six, seven, eight years old, or whether that heart is a teenager or older. And so we cultivate hearts and we want the habits to be, um, we want the habits to be such that their hearts are tuned towards it, not that their hearts are bent against it. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to do a quiet time, that's on you. Here the thing, this is why quiet time and time with the Lord is so important. And we think it's valuable and we think God will meet you when you have that time with him. But I'm not going to force you to I'm not going to force you to do it, but I'm going to give you opportunities. I'm going to provide the Bible studies, the study Bibles, the guides, and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to have it available for you, but I'm not I'm not forcing it on you. And again, yes. I'm talking about older children, right? When they were younger, we did all the things with family devotions, quiet time, you know, we did all that kind of stuff, catechisms, those kinds of foundational things. So you think about it like, um, uh, you know, for parents who homeschool, for example, they may be familiar with the classical style of education, right? And so when you have that younger age, that grammar stage, of mm-hmm. element, you know, elementary and younger, you have to give them information, right? You right. have to help them with scripture memory and those kinds of rote things that you want to instill in them. Um, and, you know, catechisms, those kind, that kind of stuff. When they get to sort of the, out of the grammar stage and into that um, middle, middle ages, you know, 10 to, you know, early or maybe nine or 10 to early teens, you're kind of moving into a different stage where you're trying to foster in them critical thinking kinds yeah. of skills. So you want to take what they learn in grammar stage and you want to help them to ask questions and to think critically about why they're doing or not doing this or that thing. And then when they get older, that's that rhetoric stage where now they're having to do all that thinking and processing and you know questioning for themselves. And so I kind of think about it like that. Like you, you know, there's stages as your children grow where you do need to give them that, you know, kind of not force feed, but you know what I'm saying, you need to give them the content. Right. And then as they grow, you kind of scale back and you start asking them questions. And then you, as they grow, then you start to see them ask their own questions. Yes. And explore. So to me, that's kind of like how I think about the development of our children and ways that we want to help them be engaged with the word of God, with the life of the church, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that all makes sense or if you have questions about that, but... Oh. So good. Yes. And I do have uh, follow-up questions. Yeah. One, is there kind of an age that you start leaning toward, okay, now you have freedom and choice? Because they're, you know, as you described, when they're little, they they do what you tell them to do, right? And you and they go where you go. But yeah. when does the choice start coming in? Uh, I do think there's a point in that kind of preteen age, maybe that double digit When they hit double digits, you can tell as a parent, you can tell because your kids start to rebel a little bit. They start to complain and, you know, and I, there's a, there's a, there's a way to look at that where you say, oh, my, my child is rebellious and, you know, they're not listening to me and they, you know, they're kind of, you know, you fear as a parent, oh my gosh, they're straying, maybe they're straying away from the faith or something. But a part of that is just natural child development, right? They're growing and they do have questions. And so as a parent, you can look at that, that little, that those seeds of rebellion or whatever you want, resistance, I'll call it not, not rebellion, resistance. You can look at those seeds of resistance and say, oh man, I need to hone this in. Or you can look at those seasons of resistance and say, okay, wait a minute, I'm getting resistance from my child. Let me ask some questions about let me ask them questions, but let me also evaluate where they are maturity wise. And maybe I need to start not force feeding them so much and scale back and start asking them questions, drawing them out. What would be most helpful to you? You know, um, do you even like, you know, I come to one, one for one of my um, children, for example, they didn't like anything packaged. You know, they just want give me the Bible, give me a journal and a pen. I'll do my own thing. Right. And, you know, I had another child. Then they just, you know, I mean, just I'm just saying each child has a different kind of bent in terms of their own personality. And I have to be open to that as a parent and say, you know what, 
she doesn't, you know, she doesn't want to have, you know, this kind of aid. Let me just, you know, give her a Bible and a journal, let her do her own own thing. Whereas I have another child and they may want to um, read a specific kind of Bible that's more accessible to them or something to that effect. Or somebody may just want to go to Awana, you know, (laughs) I want to do, you know, all the activities there, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just saying you can tell as a parent when you're meeting resistance from your child and you can see it negatively and like, oh, freak out. Oh, they're, you know, they're resisting. So, and then you double down and you're continuing to do things that really aren't fit for your particular child. We're the same way, right? We have seasons where, you know, we're leaning one way or the other. Am I going to read the Bible in a year this year? Am I going to go through a guide or am I going to do this? So why would we expect that our children would not have that? And maybe they don't have all the tools or, or maybe they're not able to put the pieces together to see that, oh, what's going on is not lack of interest, but lack of the right package for that child. Yes. Um, and so there was a point, it just kind of an example on this where, you know, we were doing family devotions and it was disastrous. Everybody hated it. <laughs> it was like, you know, you know, somebody's running around, somebody's falling asleep, somebody's not paying attention. Nobody <laughs> wants to answer questions. Everybody, you know, it's just like, this is such a chore. <laughs> right. And then my husband was like, you know what? This ain't working. So we're going to stop. And what he started doing was having individual devotions with our children for like 10, 15 minutes each. And they loved it. They got Mm -hmm. one on one time with dad. You know, they got to study something that they wanted to study together. They figured it out on their own. And it was great. And so it's okay if you don't, if the family devotion ain't working for y'all, find something else that will work for your family. Because the goal is you want them to want to spend time with the Lord. And you want them to want to grow spiritually. You don't want, you know, everybody sleep and running around the house and playing with the dog and right. you know, all that kind of stuff. If it's if it ain't working, then it's not working. Try something uh-huh. else. So Yeah. It's like yeah. finding each individual personality and how they connect. Like I think of one of my yeah, if you got six or seven kids, you can't maybe you can't do that, right? Right. <laughs> maybe you can. Maybe you can pair off some kids. I don't know. But I'm saying for, you know, the average family, you know, two, three, four kids, I think that's a doable kind of thing to think yes. about. Mm-hmm. I love the I love how you're speaking to this. Just the freedom, not only for the kids, but also for parents. Because yeah. I think especially uh, maybe maybe it's just me, but I think a lot of pastors wives they feel pressure. They feel like they have to have the perfect model, the perfect family that their kids have to be at everything because that's what people expect yeah. or you know, if they're not doing a family devotional, they're not doing it right because they're the pastor's family and you're just saying, "Okay, no, scratch all of that. What does the Lord have for you for your yeah for your family. I'd love for you to speak to that though, because I think there's a sense, some of us can feel fear that we're not doing the right things or, the, or enough of the right things or all of that. Or we, we can go on a, on a different level of control mm-hmm. and wanting to control our kids to make sure that they are doing all the right things. And so could you speak to that as a mom? How have you navigated points where you've dealt with either the fear part or the control part? Mm -hmm. Well, whether it's fear or whether it's control, um, those are things that I have to bring to the Lord. It's not saying anything about my child. It's, it's not so much of what it's saying about my child as it, as it is, what is it saying about me? Yes. Why am I fearful? Why do I feel the need to control? So the fear and control, those are, those are things that I need to take to the Lord and I need to be, you know, in God's word and in prayer and in accountability with someone processing why, my, my own fears and processing my need for control. And maybe it's a sin issue too, where I'm not giving my children, you know, over to the Lord and I, you know, and you know, I'm not giving them over to him. And because I'm not doing that, then again, that could be a part of what's raising, you know, kind of raising those issues of fear control or some, you know, some other thing. Um, and so I think, 
and so the other part of it too is when we're on those poles of fear or control, it can cause us to want to lean in tighter to our children. And for me, I have learned that those feelings that are conjuring up in my heart uh, are, ca- are, are cues for me to step back. Like I need to step back and evaluate me before I address anything with my children, right? And so, and I've learned some things in that process. I've learned how in certain instances where I was really trying to control my child, that my personality is, you know, our personalities just clash. And it's kind of like I'm trying to force them into a personality or a mold that's really not them, right? Yeah, right. And so there's no way, I, I can't make, I'm an extrovert and extroverts think that everyone should be extroverts, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, we have a problem. <laughs> we do have a problem. And so I can't make my children not be introverts. I can't give them energy that they don't have. Yeah. But when I try to control, oh, you should come out. You should, you know, come and talk to this person. You should come and do this activity. You should be involved in that. You should do that. Come on, let's do this. Let's do that. I'm killing my kids. Like, like their emotional, their emotional, physical tank is empty. So I have to realize that. Or they spent all day in school with all kinds of people. When they come home, they're tapped out. Yeah. That's just how they're wired. I can't make them something other than that. And so for me to try to force them into habits, patterns, and things that just aren't, they just aren't built for, that's just, that's unfair. So that's one of the things I learned is like, okay, so when my children come home for school from school, I'm like, what did you do? Who did you talk to? What happened with this? And da, 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 da. No, <laughs> step back and give them space let them put their headphones in, let them listen to their music, let them take a nap on in the car, you know, maybe give them a snack. They disappear for an hour or two. And when their batteries are recharged, then they come downstairs. We have beautiful conversation and it's easy. But if I'm forcing that because that's how I am, then, you know, it's really not productive. And I think we can do that in a lot of different ways on the like kind of the control fear fear factor. Right. Right, right. Um, And so for me, those things, when I feel whatever is happening in my heart happening, I'm like, okay, step back and evaluate you first and then evaluate why you're having the emotion that you're having. And is there something um, about you that needs to change? And is there something about your child that you're not accepting? Am I not accepting them for who they are, for who God has made them to be? And I'm trying for what in whatever way um, to get them to fit a mold that's just not theirs, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that's just kind of an example of in terms of how I navigate it. I navigate it by stepping back, evaluating me, take to the Lord (laughs) first. And then also evaluating, is my emotion stemming from a lack of understanding of my child? Mm. So good, Christy. That is really good. Yeah. I want to I go back to another thing that you talked about. So yeah. this was my second question that came up. Oh, okay. As you talked about your son finding his place to serve within the church, mm-hmm. I think that's another area where we, we want our kids to to love the Lord and love the church, but then we also want them to connect with the church as an individual apart from us. Yeah. So I'd love for you to speak to that of how you've helped your teenagers find their unique place in the church apart from you and your husband. Yeah. So part of it, okay, so I already talked about, I, I, I'm, I'm a stepper backer, so... <laughs> My overall theme in this whole conversation is parents, stop freaking out about your kids and just like (laughs) chill, step back. They're going to be okay. They're growing. They're children. Kids are going to kid, right? (laughs) Children are going to children. That's what they do. Um, And we don't have to freak out about it, right? And so with my son, he um, is very active in sports and those kinds of things. Um, and like mo- a lot of children, especially in the teenage years in high school, they have to have community service hours. 
well, he's so busy doing basketball and soccer, hanging out with his friends on the weekends, you know, doing all these things. Yeah. It's like, uh, bro, you got community service hours that you have to do. Like, what do you, how, how are you going to do that? And so he's, you know, it initially started with like, I can't do it then. 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 I'm like, what about Sunday? You know, we're in church and they're always looking for volunteers and children's ministry. You ever thought about that? And he was like, oh, okay. You know, maybe I'll think about that. So, you know, the initial interest <laughs> is not like, I just want to serve in the church. It's like, right. hey, community service hours in. How am I going to do that? Oh, I'm in church anyway on Sunday. Like, why don't I do it then? So, it's <laughs> but but that he's willing um and he and he um uh, that he's willing is a win for me number 1 number 2 i wouldn't say it's totally apart from us in a sense because i'm like hey you're in church every sunday you know i'm kind of you know giving him the idea but he could have said no i don't really want to do that I, you know and that would have been fine too but the other thing was when he when i brought the idea up to him for example about um serving in children's ministry. Um, and he knows he has other friends who, you know, who serve there as well. Um, but he was a little bit nervous about like going through the process. And so Mm -hmm. I said, I'll do it with you, you know, and we can both serve. And so it's not like apart from us, but it's, it's in this particular instance, it's kind of a partnership with, so we're both going through the childcare training, um, and, you know, signing up for, you know, to serve like on the same Sunday or something like that. So that he's just getting that part started now. So, you know, so it doesn't have to be fully apart, but it does have, I think it does have to do with giving them a vision for, um, the, and the life of the church being, um, something that they can be involved in. Right. And I think early on, you know, when our children were younger, just continuing to instill in them, especially when they're little, I think when they're like under the under 10, for example, and they don't, they think church is for grownups, you know, especially if you don't have like a children's ministry where children go away during the, during the service time, our children are with us during the service time. And so they drift off, they take naps, they draw, you know, (laughs) draw pictures and we found ways to kind of keep them engaged. But for the most part, when they're younger, they don't really see church as for them. And so finding those points of saying, no, um, when we go to worship on Sundays, that's for you too. And so we look for points in the sermon to say, hey, th- listen to what he's saying now. You know, he's talking about, you know, and the, like even this past, I mean, we do it, you know, all the way through, but there are so many times on a weekly basis, so many opportunities on a weekly basis that we have to say specifically, Hey, make sure you listen to this point right here. You know, like this is going to be really good for something that we talked about earlier or, Oh, did you hear what he just said? Let's talk about that later. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, like a lot of families, once, you know, we've had our worship time at church and we're having lunch, we'll talk about, just do a service review. What did you think? You know, what were your highlights? What were some things that you were left with? You know, and just kind of rehearse, you know, was there a song that really stood, you know, stood out to you this week and those kinds of things. So I think just all along the way, um, pointing them to areas of the service that does connect with them. And then as they grow, making service in a church like this is a viable option for you. You know, (laughs) like you need to serve. The church needs people to serve. You need to do service hours. The church needs people to serve. Like this is, this is a great combo right here. Let's, you know, let's see if we can make that work. Um, So yeah, I wouldn't say it's totally independent for every child, but you know, I think it's just putting those deposits in early when they're younger, giving them a vision for it. And then making it feel like, oh, this is this is natural and it's good. And it's not just because mom said so. It's because right. it's meeting a need that I have, whether it's a really practical need <laughs> or um, or a spiritual need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
that's one of my favorite things about having teenagers in in ministry is helping them because you know, we often know what the needs are, the volunteer opportunities are. And so getting to point those out to them and say, hey, that's something to consider. And it goes along with the freedom thing that you talked about earlier. They don't have to do it, but mm-hmm. hey, that that fits with your gifts. You know, you're really exactly. good at this. And they yeah. may not see that in themselves, but getting to point that out and say, well, why don't you try it? And yeah. And that's fun to watch them become their own person and learn what they're gifted for. But I think also one of the fun things for me about teenagers is seeing them develop relationships with other people in the church that it's not completely apart from me, but it's people who show a special interest in my children Mm -hmm. and encourage them or maybe come to their sports games or things like that. Like even adopted grandparents in the Mm -hmm. church, that has been a really unique joy for me and getting to talk about it with my boys and to say, um, do you, do you see how this person is loving you? Do you see, um, their gifts? Do you see their faith? Do you see, you know, how special they are? Um, that's a joy. That is true. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that you're right. So that, Again, it's not completely apart from you because sometimes you curate those relationships and a little, you know, right. you kind of nudge a little bit to curate some of those relationships, but some of them they don't. So when we, you know, when you, you know, when our families hang back after church and talk to people, I mean, it's just, I love it when adults come up to my um, son and they, you know, talk to him or my daughters and they ask them about school or ask them about sports. What you're saying, they they come to his sports um, events. Um, he they pick him up and take him out to play basketball on Saturday mornings. There's a you know group of people that play basketball on Saturday mornings, so they will you know call him up. They'll pick him up and take him to play basketball and bring him home, or just to do fun things with him. We have an older lady in the church, and she'll just grab him sometimes and go and get ice cream or pizza or Aww. you know just different things, and so. It is like, uh, that's kind of, but I think that's even broader than necessarily there. There is a part that we can play as parents in terms of curating, but it also has to do with the culture of our churches, right? And yes. have culture within our churches that allow for those relationships to um, grow and develop and to be organic and natural. So, yeah. And so yeah, you're yeah. right like that. Gosh, I, I mean, our church family really is that to us. They're like family. And so, you know, and so having them participate in our family's life in various ways like that is just a gift. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I do want to ask about some of the harder parts of raising teenagers because my, my boys are much more aware of what's going on in the church, the dynamics, like let's say, for example, a family leaves the church that they really enjoy and they're confused by that. And and that's hard sometimes for us, my husband and I, to know what to share with them, how much, how do we help them with that? Can you speak to that? Are there certain boundaries that you you and the BD have put in place to protect your kids from some of the harder things or ways that you help them process the harder things? Mm -hmm. That's good. I think, again, you know, let's just talk about it from teenagers. I think when children are observant, even in the preteen ages, you know, so they're very observant. So it's a balance of trying to be honest and give as much information as you can without damaging relationships or confidences. Right. And so it's not too unlike what a pastor does, <laughs> you know, when they have to share with the congregation, for example, something difficult, right? So sometimes pastors, you know, in a members meeting or something, they may have to share something difficult yeah. uh, that's happening with the family or that has happened in the life of the church. And they have to do that in a way that is, you know, as upfront as possible, but also with a heart and mind towards, I want to honor that individual and I want to keep their reputation, you know, intact as much as possible. Do you know what I mean? Not overshare um, 
And so I think it's the it's the same thing in, you know, in our families with our children and trying to say, OK, this is what I can share. This is what I can share with you right now. Right. Here's the issue broadly. This is what happened. And and even if it's something maybe we're personally hurt, you know, finding a way to say, like, this is how it hurt us. But this is how the Lord calls us to love our brothers and sisters in the faith. And so Mm -hmm. for me, that just, you know, the kinds of things that I would say out there (laughs) to like people within out there in terms of in our church community, but also in the broader community, um, I have to be able to say those, you know, inside my home with my family. Right. Right. So, um, so yeah, just that balance of saying, this is what I can share. Maybe if there's a hurt, this is how it hurt, but this is how the Lord calls us to love our brothers and sisters that we might disagree with on something, or we may think they're doing something unwise, something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Yeah. 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 But, and then, you know, at least in our home, as you know, my husband's a pastor, my kids see a lot more (laughs) and hear a lot more than say, if you're not necessarily, you know, if you're, if you're in a church, but not, um, in a ministry leadership kind of position. So they have just been around and heard and seen a lot more. Um, And so I think it gives us a little bit more freedom to share um, because it's quote unquote normal. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Um, one last question. I'm just thinking of moms who are entering into the teenage years. They're their children, they're having to make that adjustment and saying, oh no, you know, not, oh no, but my kids are, are needing things differently than they used to. And, um, they're looking, they're listening to this and, and they've soaked in your wisdom. Is there any biblical truth that you would give them or you would, you go back to in parenting teenagers that you would leave us with? Yeah. Hold on. I got to find the passage. So this is, uh, verse that I like to hold on to as a parent with teens and going into teen, teen, the teen years. So in Philippians 4, many of us are familiar with um, verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Verse nine is the one that I want to hone in on. Verse nine says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So I think my biblical encouragement to um, those who are out there listening is um, to have a life worth emulating before your children. And this will kind of naturally occur. They will be learning and receiving and hearing from you and seeing things in you. And as they do learn, hear, see, (laughs) receive, they're going to practice what they see in your life. And so my encouragement is like to practice those things. So you're the one as a parent, I'm the one as a parent that has to live out whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable. I have to live in that way and have a life that is worth emulating so that as my children see me doing these things, they will want to do them too. Mm -hmm. And again, that's kind of the overarching theme of our time here is like a, a lot of parenting of teens is just really trusting the Lord and trusting that the things that your children see, hear, receive from you, that they're going to be practicing those things. And so it's not so much uh, forcing into them or out of them particular outcomes, but it's just living a faithful life as someone who loves the Lord Jesus and watching the Lord develop in them the godly character and habits that they see in you Mm -hmm. as a parent. And so just trust the Lord in that. You might not see it when they're 10, 11, 12, 13. You might not see it right away, but be very, very, very quick to acknowledge 
when you do, when you see godliness, when you see um, your children acting, acting justly and, and righteous, when you see them taking up, you know, uh, on, on behalf of someone else who might be hurting, uh, when you see them telling the truth in a difficult situation with, that puts them at some sort of risk, when you see them doing those things, be quick to acknowledge it before them, commend them for it, to show them and, and, and let them know that this is this is a godly and Christ-like way in which they're in which they're carrying themselves. And mm. so look for those opportunities, acknowledge them when you see them, um, and then just chill, enjoy your kids. There's so much teenagers are so much fun. They are. You know, there's enough there's enough to freak out about in life <laughs> and in ministry. Um we don't really have to freak out about our children. We can just enjoy them. And that would be my encouragement. That is so good. And I concur. I love having teenagers. So Chrissy, thank you. This has been so good. So rich with insight and truth. So thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Thanks so much for listening to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. If you found this content helpful, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcast platform or share it with a friend. You can find this podcast and other helpful resources at ministrywivespodcast.com.